Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and this is CityWorks, the show about work and working people. CityWorks is a co-production of the School of Labor and Urban Studies at the City University of New York and CUNY TV. This time, we're talking about police unionism in a time of Black Lives Matter. Do police and carceral workers deserve a place in our labor movement, and can they occupy that place if that movement is genuinely to be a force for racial justice. That's our question for today. And joining me to talk about it are two people with their finger on the pulse of this debate. Terry Melvin is the executive director of the newly created Racial Justice Task Force at the AFL-CIO. He is also the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. David Unger, an activist and author, among other things, recently wrote on this subject a very excellent article for the New Labor Forum, the journal coming out of the school. I want to welcome them both, Terry and um, David. Welcome to CityWorks. I'm going to start with you, David. Y you began that piece by describing the scene. We may have seen the scene outside the White House. You described the scene in Washington, D.C. at the AFL-CIO building. What did you see there? Uh, so well, I'm here in New Jersey currently in the midst of all of this, but my, uh, my parents who are longtime unionists uh, live blocks from the White House. And on a daily walk, they would send me pictures of the Trump fence covered in posters, covered in calls for justice. And then they would send me photos of the AFL-CIO building. And especially after uh, the AFL-CIO building was somewhat ransacked during one of the protests. The windows were broken, a small fire was set, and boards got put up on the windows. And what was striking was that in the midst of calls for black liberation, calls for black lives, calls for defunding the police, it was only at the House of Labor that the first questions were being posed about cops in the AFL-CIO. And these aren't new questions. These are questions that have come up at various points of labor history and as recently as a few years ago during uh, the first round of Black Lives Matter protests. But it was striking that this was the only place where the direct question about police unions and how police unions intersected with the movement and whether our movement could represent change or black lives or the movement for, for racial liberation and represent cops. And so I thought that juxtaposition uh, really highlighted the question that we as a movement have to wrestle with today, which is how do we be a movement for economic and racial liberation and deal with the realities of a very diverse, ideologically diverse workforce, um, including carceral workers and tens of thousands of carceral workers all over the country. Let's just clarify who we're talking about, David, when we're talking about police and carceral workers. It's not just the, the, the men in blue, men and women in blue. Uh, I think that's, uh, there are somewhere upwards of two million people employed, publicly employed, uh, in the criminal justice system, uh, ranging from police to corrections to probation and parole to district attorneys and the like. Uh, and that actually doesn't even include the additional support. Uh, everyone from a janitor at the police station or somebody who's building a jail or maintaining a jail or the small private prison industry. So it is a major industry. Uh, mass incarceration and really the warehousing and subjugation of primarily black and brown communities is a major industry in the United States, uh, somewhere around $200 billion industry mm. every year. And coming to you, Terry, how many of those workers, police and carceral workers, are in unions and, and which ones? Well, uh, most of the um, uh, unionized police officers are not in the AFL-CIO. Uh, we have approximately a little over 100,000 uh, members that fall into the category of law enforcement that arrange in different unions in, uh, within the AFL-CIO, uh, but most of them are, are with the FOP. 
um, and the fraternal are not, order of police. Right, fraternal order of police, uh, and are not a part of the AFL-CIO. However, they are unions amongst themselves. So talk a bit about the conflict as you see it. I mean, talk as a person first, and then, and then maybe uh, as the executive director of the task force and, and, and the president of the union, the coalition, as, as a person, do, do you feel that there can be cops represented in our unions if Black lives are to matter to those unions? Yeah, well, I, I think that there is, a, and I've taken a very hard position that we should, as a movement, be open to everyone. Now, let's be real. As a Black man, uh, I, I live this every day. I have been pulled over uh, for no reason at all other than being driving while being Black. Uh, I have been pulled over in my own neighborhood based on where I live and the type of uh, vehicle that I drive because I'm a Black man. So I get that. I get the systematic racism that is in this country. But when you look at the labor movement and you look at who should be and should not be in the labor movement, I am very concerned that we uh, look to fix the system which causes the problem that we have within law enforcement rather than throwing out the baby with the bathwater, if you will. Everyone in this country should have a right to come together to organize against uh, the employer so that they would have decent wages and working conditions. Everybody should have that right. Let me ask you about, you talked about employers. In your classic union system is you have workers collectively bargaining for their rights um, from their management, their employers. In this case, we're the employers. I mean, the police are public servants. Wouldn't that be kind of like, I don't know, the army having a union? No, I mean, I, well, you have to understand, I come from, and I'm a proud member of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. I, I worked for 40 years as a public servant uh, outside of my union uh, positions that I've held. And I should have a right as a public employee to stand up and have collectively come together to work with uh, my other brothers and sisters within the movement to demand equal pay and equal rights and, and adjust working conditions for myself and my members. Just because I'm a public employee, and that is exactly, Laura, what my problem is with people who say, push all the police officers out. Because if we buy that, then we buy, don't have any healthcare workers because we ought to be able to tell the healthcare workers to work when we want them to. And don't have any social workers that are public employees because we should be able to, they should work it whenever we need them to. It is a system that is built on a cooperative relationship. All right, so coming to you, David, I mean, we hear repeatedly that it's the union contract, it's the union uh, endorsements, it's union leaders, and I think of the director of the, of the, the FOP in, in Minneapolis, who are the face of obstructionism when it comes to reform in city after city. Um, can these two facts be, be, be brought together? Uh, this is the inherent tension, is that I think there is a general understanding and acceptance that, uh, that police union contracts have been used to block accountability and reform. There is a general acceptance that there is a, is a dynamic tension between the ability of, uh, of police to have sort of extrajudicial rights. And there are questions about uh, whether the right to kill somebody has a way of giving, of meaning that you have to attain a much higher level of accountability that we haven't reached. But, my, my big thing is actually, I think this is the wrong proxy. Uh, whether or not police unions are part of the AFL-CIO or whether or not police are directly able to uh, negotiate just like everybody else is the wrong question for a labor movement that is seeking to determine whether or not it can truly stand up for economic and racial justice. What change are you working for uh, concretely right now, Terry, at the Racial Justice Task Force? What we're doing is looking to really uh, inculcate, as I said earlier, 
the work of social justice into everything that we do. We want to be looking at it from that lens. And uh, we are going to look at how do we get this to, to the ground level, the city level, with our central labor councils, with our area labor federations, and with our state feds, to really start having conversations with their members and with their communities on what the needs are there and how we can be of help to each other as we go forward. David, do you think those people with their um, writing the signs outside the AFL will be satisfied? I mean, their, their language was, we don't want to see statements, we want to see action. What are they looking for? And I agree, and I don't, we don't want to see performative resolutions. We want to see action, right? And that's uh, what we're looking to do. Right. At the end, of, yeah. To do. Laura, that's what we're looking to do. We're not, I, I, and, and we're not in this to do another statement. We're not in this to do another uh, letter. We're not in this to do another report. We've done all the writing that we want to do. This is about action. And that's a, so the next a, time you next time you have Black Lives Matter protesters in the streets of New York and you have NYPD members battening them and tear gassing them, will the union movement, AFL CIO, get in between? The union movement will be right there. The union movement has been out there with the marches. We've had coalition of black trade unionists, we have had unions within the New York City standing with those marchers every day and many of them wearing their union paraphernalia with them to let them know that we are a part of what they are doing. We're not walking away from this. We're standing up with them. So now we're gonna go, I think, to the Q&A portion of our conversation. And I wanna thank everybody who's been watching us on the live webinar um, to do a little reveal. We've been following uh, and followed by uh, an audience live and online. I used to say in studio, but we don't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> And we have a bunch of questions. So if you're up for this, Terry, David, you up for a few questions? All right, certainly. I don't know who. Audience question, does the AFL-CIO's cautious and quiet approach hurt its longer term objectives for growth by not empowering the new generation activist wing, which wants to advance more robust commitment to social justice? Terry, I, I imagine you have a few thoughts on that. Well, we're right. I, I would say uh, last year, uh, I will give you a different answer than I'm going to give you right now. I think the AFL-CIO right now is in the right place. And they are picking up and they are working with. We are trying to bring in all of our allies, uh, the young workers we're reaching out to uh, that are in the thick of this. Uh, we're re reaching out to our progressive allies that are out there in the thick of this. And we're a part of this entire movement. So uh, do we move as fast as everybody thinks we ought to move? Probably not, but I think right now we're in the right spot, we're in the right place, and we're moving in the right direction. And it is all steam ahead right now. We're not in the slow, we're not going back to check. We've got the approval to move forward, and that's what we're going to do. And, and look, all I, right, I, David. I, there are those who say that even that 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 Terry's commission is is a delay tactic, right? However. We actually have to get this right. We have to put in the work to get this right. There are 14 million members represented by AFL-CIO unions, something, something in the neighborhood. Um, and a third of them voted for Trump in the last election. Uh, we have resolutions that can pass at a body like the California Labor Federation, which represents about 15% of all union workers in the country. Um, but that's a vote of delegates. Have we put in the work with the rank and file membership, many of whom um, I'm not sure are automatically on our side, but have we put in the, the deep organizing and education work to bring a solidaristic movement, a majoritarian solidaristic movement towards racial and economic justice? Other than that, if we haven't, that's being performative. That's, res that's paper resolutions. And that's those who say, no, all you have to do is kick out cops, is, a, is, a, is ignoring that if we want to actually make change, we've got to bring a hugely powerful and organized and solidaristic movement together to do so. Now that has been the call of many movements around the country over the last few years and, and beyond. I mean, whether you're talking participation in elections at all, or whether you're talking comparable issues like violence against women, the Me Too movement, 
immigration, I mean, that call for organized work on the ground, face to face, mouth to mouth, I guess you can't mask to mask maybe, um, on the ground, yours is called a task force, not a commission, say task is, you have your tasks you're, you're gonna be undertaking. Is that kind of door to door work part of it, Terry? That is definitely a part of it. That is, if we are, as I said, we're, we're, we're getting this down to the ground level, to the member to member level. We're going to interface with folks. We're going to have conversations with folks. We're going to do, have trainings on this so that our leadership understand what it's about and what they need to be sensitive to when they're out in front of their members. But as David said, this is not something you can't just turn on a switch tomorrow and all this stuff happens. Yeah. We've got to ask out how do we do this? and come up with the training and get it out there as quickly as possible, but we've got to have the right package. Is there a gender justice task force? I'm just wondering. Is there a? Gender justice task force? That is a part of, it's, it's talking about racial justice. It is talking about how all this comes together, race, um, ethnicity, we're talking about gender, we're talking about age, uh, which is something that has been left out of the discussion for quite some time. Uh, we are looking at the whole, the wholeness of it, not leaving out anybody in the discussion. There are very specific issues, though, with respect to policing in the African American community and Black people in America, and I think that's one of the questions um, that is going to come up often in our Q and A here. Doesn't it seem like the protections provided by the unions only help that rot to spread? I, I don't necessarily agree with that at all. I mean, it is. Uh, Yes, you know, it, it, we all admit that there are some bad apples and, and I understand the, the way that the, the uh, person is using that. Uh, we do need to get to the systematic racism that has built our judicial system from its inception. So if we just talk about, let's fix the cops and we don't fix the systematic racism that built the system and that what the system is based around, then you can change all the cops. And in five years, you're going to have the same problem. Because yeah, they're I mean, just to looking at the same issues and they're still looking at it the same way. The, the, our uh, judicial system is not put in place for, for police officers to protect and serve, as we say that we want them to do. Regular folks, I want to be protected. I want our police to serve our community. That's not what happened. They're not protecting people. They're protecting businesses. They're protecting property. And we've got to change that and, and change the, what we want them to do. And that can only be done at the ground level. In all these jurisdictions, people must come together and work together to change the way their police uh, forces are working within, the, uh, within their jurisdictions. That does get to that question of the foundations of the system. I mean, the police force was indeed created to protect property at a time when property was people, uh, included black people. Um, Correct. Can that be reformed, I think, is, is the core question of our moment. David. I think that the, I mean, if you're, if, if the question is, do we need to start over on a system of, of, on a quote, criminal legal system that does not work? The answer is yes. Um, how we get there, this is, a, this, is, this is as much a tactical question as anything. How do we get to a point where politicians, and again, this is bipartisan, there has been a bipartisan move over the last 50 years to empower police to do what they're doing. Um, people who talk about police unions without sort of while separating them and decontextualizing them from government's lack of funding for services, from, from politicians who want to be seen as tough on crime, who have been signing off, uh, basically in a sense, many of the languages we're talking about uh, and Campaign Zero did a large study of 81 police union contracts, but they actually didn't only look at police union contracts. They looked at police union contracts and police officer bill of rights. These things are codified into law. Uh, much like, for instance, their contracts are legally binding documents with politicians. We have to be taking on the entire system 
of which police are part of it. But if we don't have the power to do so, and if we don't do it surgically and strategically, uh, I totally under, black workers are disproportionately represented in labor unions, and in part are disproportionately represented in labor unions because of the public sector. We have to figure out a way to make sure, as Terry said, that whatever our changes are actually community supportive and are not performative. So we only have a couple more minutes, but I'll, I'll summarize a couple of the questions. And one of them gets to this question of the difference between police and other public employees. Um, typically public employees, the questioner points out, do not carry lethal weapons, then not having the legal right to kill a person. Um, the police history we've just talked about. Uh, there's also a point raised by another questioner that the police have actively worked to break unions, to break strikes, worked mm -hmm. for management. Police are not unions, they're associations, this audience member writes. They shouldn't be afforded the power that comes with its association with strong, uh, large, strong unions. So uh, pick which piece of that you're, you, you will, but I'd love some, some summarizing thoughts from the two of you. Maybe start with you, David, and come to Terry. Uh, again, this question of uh, the semantics of associations or unions and workers, uh, police are there, they are from the working class, they are drawn from working people and working communities, they're married into working communities are the sons and daughters of working communities and in many communities are and if you want to talk about carceral workers and corrections officers are also the black and brown workers who are who because it's the only job in town uh, whether or not their associations or unions misses the point every group of worker or every group of people will come together for mutual aid they will figure out a way to use their power to defend themselves the question is, can we set the conditions on the ground? Can we use our political power and capital to ensure that the money's flowing to the right place, to ensure that accountability is there, to press one of the resolutions passed in California was about ensuring the democratic oversight and civilian oversight of police departments. Can we, this is a, this is a community issue that is so much bigger than a narrow question of police unionism. And when we reduce it to only that question, I feel like we miss the, <laughs> we miss the point. And we certainly will not actually get to a place of racial justice and liberation if, it's, if, that's, our, if that's our only path. Let me say, I, uh, going back to earlier comments, it is clear to me that in order for us to be a more perfect union, that we all must try to come together. Um, we cannot, uh, no matter if we want it to, you can't stop organizations from coming together, similar to what David said. Um, they're gonna come together, you can call them a union, you can call them an association, you can call them an organization. Like folks are gonna come together, the KKK came, came together and they still coming together, okay? Like folks are gonna come together to help each other meet their needs. So you're not gonna stop that. But what we can deal with and what we must deal with is the systematic root of what's causing the problem. And, and, and again, we need to go down to the root level and deal with that at that level, eradicate it at that level. Don't let people get saddled with the issue of do the uh, police have representation or not? Everybody should have representation. We should not allow that to be what stops us. What we should continue to go on is see what changes we need to make and understand that these contracts, the contracts that the, the police have, whether FOP or in the AFL-CIO, they didn't just walk in, lay down a piece of paper and a contract and said, this is what we're going to have, this is what we're going to want, and the, the, the management or the politician said, okay. There was negotiations that went back and forth for them to get to what they have in the contract. But there is no contract that says you have a right to murder. There is no contract that says you have the right to, to uh, take on particular people based on the color of their skin. There is no contract that says you have a right to discriminate, but there is a system that allows that to happen. And that's what we have to get to. We have to get to the system, change the system. And I believe 
that if we all work together on this, like we have all these people walking out in the streets, black, brown, gay, straight, young, old, if we all start working together on this, we are greater in number than those who want to stop us. We are greater in number than those that want to keep the status quo. And if we all start working together, we can start seeing a change sooner versus later. Well, that's it for this month's edition of CityWorks. I want to thank you both, Terry Melvin and David Unger. You can find out more information about both of our guests at our website. And if you have comments or suggestions for us and CityWorks, uh, write to cityworks at slu.cuny. That's CUNY. CUNY.edu. That's cityworks at slu.cuny.edu. For CityWorks, I'm Laura Flanders.